talk about each one. Those of you that may not know, this is a T-54, also known as a T-55 if, if it had one additional feature. Now we actually got this one from the Jock Littlefield collection several years ago in California. This was actually in the movie uh, Courage Under Fire with Meg Ryan and Denzel Washington. So there's a bit of history. When we got it, it didn't run. We could start it up, but it wouldn't move. And our guys got to work on it, and I know it needs a paint job, but it's been through a few battles. This is a, a, a vehicle that you still see the Russians are bringing out and putting them in battle in, uh, in, the, in the war in Ukraine as we speak. So it's a 105 millimeter cannon. This was, it's designed in the late 40s, and uh, up to, uh, geez, up to, it, the T-34 had a record number of 80,000. I think there was 155,000 of these produced. They were used all over the world, and they're still in a number of armies today. 
And when we're looking at the battle, I should say the Gulf War, this was the main tank that the Iraqis used. They had more advanced ones, but this was the numerous one. Those are fuel, fuel tanks on the back for any long distance stuff. And you can see it's a pretty robust tank. It was ahead of its time, that's for sure, when it first came out. So we're going to see how this does. It's got a Dishka machine gun, heavy machine gun on the top, and you're going to hear that bark, and that's amazing. So that's it. We're going to we're going to move on to the other ones. that out. Now you probably all heard of Land Rover. They're pretty popular today. Well, back then, this is called a dinky. This is a 90 centimeter between the two wheels, the wheelbase, and it's like a little war wagon. These were used, you probably heard of the Rat Patrol in World War II, and, and this is what they used in the Gulf for patrolling ahead. It's aluminum body, it's got a diesel engine. The thing is very easy to maintain and it runs like a clock. And you can see we have twin machine guns on the back. And you want to see what they sound like, the twin machine guns? You do, you want to hear this, okay. Okay, how about the front one? Oh, that's enough, save it for the battle. We don't want them to run out of ammo in the middle of the battle. Okay, that's it. Bring up the scorpion. Now these three gentlemen are all veterans of the Gulf War. These three gentlemen The driver is the original driver from the Gulf War in that vehicle. Same vehicle. That's Stu Craddock. This gentleman here closest to my, on my left here that's John Whiffen. He commanded his own vehicle. By the way, this is called a Scorpion. It's, a, it's called a CVRT, Combat Recce uh, Vehicle Track. And it has a 76 millimeter cannon. And you're gonna hear that fire. I'm not gonna give you a sample now. It might clear the front seats. But you get about an eight foot flame coming out of that. And you're gonna see this in the battle. Pretty cool. And we have the commander of the vehicle is Staff Sergeant Les Critchlow. Hey. They're all characters, you should get to know them. And you can talk to these guys down there. Now, Stu's the only original driver for this vehicle. They each had a vehicle to themselves and commanded them. But they're brothers in the 14th, 20th King's Hussars. And they're show-offs too. Great bunch of guys. They've been coming over here for about eight or nine years. And it's funny, all the different regiments that come here, they're like a band of brothers. They see each other every year and it's... We had a bit of an emotional moment there yesterday. We had three veterans, American veterans from the Gulf War, drive up from Wisconsin and they actually went over and talked to the, gr the group here. It was pretty cool. Now, some of you must have seen this vehicle before. The Humvee. This is the earliest version. This is a 1985 Humvee. I got this one out of El Paso, Texas, from the police chief's husband. 
and it's pretty. The early ones didn't have a lot of armor. There's a little bit in the in the in the doors, and that's about it. The, it's got a hatchback. This one. It's very versatile. They go anywhere. You see the exhaust is up in the air for wading into some deeper water. And this is mounting a cupola on the top of the 50 cal. You don't have anything. Do you have anything loaded? Can you point that way and give it a taste? This is loud. Whoa, okay. I wouldn't want to be in the receiving end of that one. These are blanks, okay? They're, they're Hollywood. This is movie stuff. All of our stuff is movie stuff, okay? Just so you know. And that's it. That's driven by Izzy Roberts. She's a member, one of the many members, of the 200 members we have. And she sits on our board, too. Thanks, Izzy. As these vehicles are going off, they're being staged down by our, what we call the Thunderdome. They're being staged down there in preparation for the battle, which is coming right after this. Okay, we have two strikers. This is the first one. And we only have enough room in the field for one. So tomorrow we bring out the other one and this crew goes to a different vehicle. You see, the missiles are being raised in the back. I don't know if you can see from down there. This is called a striker. It's also a CVRT, combat, recce. Uh, oh, I got it all screwed up. <laughs> combat vehicle recce track, because it's got tracks. And this is made of a, a aluminum magnesium alloy. It's not steel, so it makes it very light. But this, this configuration is called a striker, and the missile platform just raised up. Now this fires swing fire missiles, and these missiles could take out any main battle tank. The range is approximately four, four kilometers, 4,000 meters. Did I get that right? Calvin, gentleman at the top, he was the gunner. So Calvin took out a few things. Did you take out a truck once? The first one he hit was a BMP, same BMP that we have down there, BMP-1. But, and the commander is Sean Bannister. He wasn't in this vehicle. This vehicle itself was Calvin's. So he, he's original this vehicle. The driver just goes to show how we make friends easy is Rick Stewart. He's up from California or over. He comes out every year. We, we can't get him out of this. We have to feed him in it. He won't leave. But, so this vehicle has seen a lot of action. And when I got it, there was a tree growing out of it. Like it was out in the bush. And we get it. It has a Jaguar engine, a J60 Jaguar engine. Most of them do. We have one exception. So that's it. Now remember, this is a striker, the one leaving. That's a striker. It doesn't have any big guns. So when it went in the field, it had four of these in front of it to protect it. So remember, every time the striker went out in combat, on patrol, because it didn't have any big gun other than the missiles, it had four, scorpion, four scimitars. That's the name of this one. And again, it's a CVRT. It's the same chassis but we have a different turret on it. Remember the one before was a Scorpion, it had a bigger cannon. So this one here, this is actually, the driver is, oh you, face the group, face the group. Uh, 
That's John. John Seely. And John is actually, he crewed on the other striker that we have. But because we're only put two, I let this, that crew drive the scimitar. And this is, it's Peter, Brad, you take your choice what you want to call him. But he's also, and it's so funny because I just met him yesterday, or Friday. Well, yeah, yesterday. And I saw pictures of them when they were all young, 34 years ago. And that driver, he's a guy that in every picture, you know there's one in every group, and he's like this and all the pictures and that. <laughs> so then I meet him, even though he's got a beard, I knew exactly, recognize him from the pictures of the Gulf War. So this is a scimitar, it's a 30 millimeter Raritan cannon. It's a higher firing thing. And we have this set up, this will be firing, it's not as loud as the big uh, Scorpion with the 76, but it fires quicker, and you'll see that. And it's all oxygen propane, there's no gunpowder, there's no bullet or propellant or projectile leaving the, at, in any way. And the other guy's Glenn Hines, my buddy, we were in, we were in the Ontario Regiment together at 16. Okay, this is a big one. This is an American M60, and you probably, during the Gulf War, the Americans used for the first time the Abrams, but the Marine Corps, they actually used an M60s with special armor on them, and they freed the Kuwaiti airport. They led an assault on the Kuwaiti airport during the Gulf War, and this vehicle represents that. U.S. Marine Corps and their involvement. And for those of you that uh, uh, were here yesterday, you saw the, um, we had Battle Royale. So we have two vehicles that go at it and uh, they fire oxygen propane cannons. This cannon will fire during the, the, the show coming up. But it's also in the uh, Battle Royale where we put two of them together. It's a World of Tanks Battle Royale. And we have Brandon Way Brandon, he's the commander. He's again one of our jack of all trades members. And we have Ashley. Ashley is the driver. Wave Ashley. And that's the crew. And we have Peter from Australia. He came all the way over here to help us out from Australia. Peter did. I told him that we don't have kangaroos. He said that don't matter. Let's bring, let's bring both scorpions up. Let's get the other scorpion up here too. two vehicles we have three scorpions I've already spoke about the first one and we have two more and there were during the Gulf there were three main armored regiments British armored regiments and we have one scorpion because every tank regiment had scorpions as scout cars they went ahead of the tanks to look and see what was going on so this one here two three alpha this is the Queen's Royal Irish Hussars and driver we have is George Clark. He's the original driver from the Gulf War. And you're all welcome to speak to these veterans when you go over there. George, if you ask him, 
what did you drive? And he said, well, I drove a Scorpion. Well, which one is yours? He says, none. His got blown up. A, an American Abrams mistakenly thought he was an Iraqi and fired and took out the front. It was a miracle that this guy's alive today. So he's here and he brought his wife over to, to join in all the festivities. On the top we have George Clegg. He's from the Queen Dragoon Guards. If you want to know everything about Sultans and command posts, go down there, you'll see him where the big blue flag is hanging way up in the air. He's, again, his regiment and George, we've got two Georges in this thing, are veterans of the Gulf War. And Sophie's there giving, giving support. Say, hey, Sophie. Okay, nice good wrap. Let's bring the next one up here. Like this, this is done up like a Royal Scots uh, regiment, the armored regiment, and this was one of their recce vehicles. But we don't have anyone from that particular regiment. But what we have as a driver is Lottie, and she's from Australia, and she's heavily involved. She comes out all the time to help us out. There's nothing she can't drive or fix. The commander up top there, or that's Matty Pyle. Matty came over here, he's not been in the military, but he loves tanks, and he was very, what's the term, instrumental in connecting us with the Royal Jordanian Tank Museum, of which we have a, a strategic and partner, a partnership with, a sharing agreement. And as soon as things clean up in the uh, Middle East, we plan on having some ceremony signing uh, thing there. We're, not, we're talking about doing trade of some vehicles and stuff like that. That's the Royal Jordanian Tank Museum. And the last but not least is Mac McGinnis and he is a 14th, 20th King Sassaz and he served in one of those. Were you? Were you a driver, a gunner? What were you? He was a gunner. I thought you were a jack of all trades, but anyways. Again, let's hear it for the veterans and the participants. Okay, bring up the third. Like I told you, they're all getting positioned so we can start the battle as soon as possible. The T-54 is already down there, ready to go. They're just itching for a fight. Okay, this is a Farad scout car. And this, there was an iconic picture that was in all the magazines, and it's taken from this angle here. And Jim's the driver, Jim Lindsay, and he was down below. Josh is the lieutenant, and this is the original crew, exactly original crew from this vehicle in the Gulf War. Could you imagine spending months sleeping underneath or beside a vehicle for three, four months, and then you go into combat and everything? These guys got to know each other real well. And when I brought them over, they had not seen their wagon, their, their, the, you know, the thing that kept them safe for that time. And they got rather emotional when they first came over and saw it. So again, please feel free to speak to Joshua or um, Jim over there in the Desert War area. We'd love to share the stories with you. Great guys, great veterans. Thank you guys so much. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my way up to the top of one of the, the bleachers here because I kind of choreographed everything from up there with my radio just so that everything moves forward. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Jeremy and we'll talk to you in a bit. All right. Thank you, Al. This is going to be the finale of the morning show. And, and I was talking to you about how the safety and the radio controls, you saw that everyone was wearing headsets in the vehicles. So Al is going to make his way up into the top of the bleacher. So uh, when he gets to that bleacher, if you guys just don't mind just making him a little space to stand, because from up there with his radio, uh, he is going to be controlling what you're about to experience. This is going to be uh, very similar to, well, I guess you're not going to control the battle without this. No. <laughs> there we go. So 
You know, very unique to have the actual vehicles, not just an example of the vehicle, but the actual vehicle that served in that conflict and reunited with the veterans who served. So at uh, Aquino Tank Weekend, you know, that's just one of the many segments of the show, but uh, I encourage you for the rest of the day or tomorrow, if you're still here, get some ch uh, chance to head down there to the desert uh, and speak to these veterans and they can tell you the details of their service, uh, exactly where they serve, what happened to them, and st uh, stories of, about those vehicles. So this is the segment, the finale, that's going to be exceptionally loud. Uh, we, you did get a little example of some small arms fire there, but there's going to be uh, the vehicles firing. There's going to be infantry with small arms. There's going to be ground explosions. This is as close as you can get to living history and just a tiny glimpse of experiencing what it was like for those guys back in 1990, 1991 in the Gulf War. Now you can see uh, the only people that are not uh, in uniform out here. Once again, let's uh, say hi to Max FX. They're just making sure that everything is ready to go, boom. And I'll wait for them to give me the signal. All right. Did Al make it up to a bleacher yet? Oh, he's on his way up. Thanks so much, guys, just for accommodating him. He needs to have a, a commanding view of the, of the World of Tanks arena. Okay, the field is prepared. Just gonna let the uh, pyrotechnicians get clear. A lot of moving vehicles. Uh, in this, this is the segment of the show where there will be more armor moving at one time uh, than any other segment uh, during a Quito Tank weekend. We have lots of more shows, uh, but like all that armor you just saw is going to be moving in the field. So I have to make sure that it is clear and everyone is safe. Okay, fire technicians, are you guys good to go? Safe? Okay. Sunray, Sunray. The field is yours. So to set the scene, uh, 1990, uh, Saddam Hussein and Iraqi forces invade their neighbor, Kuwait. And an international coalition is put together to oust the Iraqis from Kuwait. Now the, the Iraqi forces, uh, yet although they had a lot of conscripts, they were actually pretty hard. So they had a few really hard regiments uh, that were very experienced. They had Soviet tanks, but they didn't have one key thing. And this was a new technology that today you just take for granted. But they didn't have GPS. So at this time, Global positioning system was actually a military technology. It allowed the allies to know exactly where they were in the desert instead of using landmarks. So the Iraqi forces, uh, they put all of their armor and their stronger uh, brigades uh, towards the obvious routes. And the allies were roaming through the desert in a massive flanking maneuver to catch the Iraqis off guard. Imagine all this armor, American, British, uh, the Canadians supplied air power and a field hospital. It was a large coalition in the 1990s. So what we're gonna see here 
is the Iraqis are in a defensive position. They do not expect to see the enemy that's going to be coming straight out of the desert and into their flank. Now, very slowly, you see the recce elements of uh, the British forces of Operation Granby. That was the operational name uh, for the United Kingdom's forces. You see the Ferret Scout car, light armored car, some good protection, open top. And the Land Rover. So they're out ahead of the main force looking for the enemy, look, uh, reporting back on ground conditions. They're not going to stick around and fight, they're reporting back via radio. See Land Rover? Providing covering fire, keeping those uh, Iraqi soldiers with their heads down. And that open top desert vehicle, not a lot of protection. So the Iraqi. The Iraqi fi uh, fire back. They are now alerted but they have no idea what's coming up behind those reconnaissance elements. Here it comes, here's the, the heavy reconnaissance. The CBRTs firing on the Iraqi position. The American Humvee there is up on Overwatch. Iraqi forces are completely pinned down. Here comes their reinforcement. They're bringing in their heavy armor. The T-54, boom, fires back. CBRTs are, are swarming the Iraqi tank. Most of the shots are, are bouncing off the armor, but the crew is confused. Firing from the Humvee. Fire from the dish cup on the T fifty four. Everyone's awake in the Iraqi camp. They're now moving forward. Infantry moving behind the CBRTs. 
now the American armor has arrived on the scene, supporting their British allies. Infantry moving up. He's going to get a Humvee there supporting with a 50 count, covering those British infantry. But still, the Iraqi tank is still there, kind of pinning down. Now here comes the swarm. The tank crew has surrendered. You look at the hands up there on the uh, T-54. They know they're outmatched. And once again, many of the uh, forces, uh, the Iraqi forces, were conscripts. The striker positioning itself in the field just in case there's any more Iraqi armor coming up that could take out uh, any of the T-55s or T-72s uh, the Iraqi forces have. And the Iraqi infantry have no doubt thrown in the towel. And that's pretty much how quickly uh, these engagements uh, between Western forces and Saddam Hussein's forces uh, ended in the 1990-91 Gulf War. All right, so let's hear it for our veterans and volunteers for the Gulf War reenactment. How was that? Woo! So this, that's the finale of this afternoon's show. I'll let you know what's coming up. Out in the field. Okay, uh, I know there's a lot of modern military equipment here, but if you're interested in medieval history, uh, knights, we have Blades of Glory out in uh, Worthington Commons, and they have special demos where you'll actually see knights fighting in armor with swords. Uh, they have one at uh, 1.30 this afternoon and one at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So you can head out there to see Blades of Glory. We hope you enjoyed our morning presentation. The day's not over. So much to see out there. Uh, so much to do. Please visit the gift shop. Uh, if you're looking for lunch, we have four food trucks on the site. And if you're looking for refreshment, you can head over to the historic green buildings across the commons there. That is the historic 420 wing Royal Canadian Air Force Association Clubhouse. Uh, and they have beverages from pop to beer or whatever it is you fancy. So again, this is Jeremy. Thank you so much for coming to Aquino Tank Weekend, the Canadian Tank Museum, and I'll see you at 2 o'clock for the afternoon show, the Second World War and the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Aquino from 1944. And I'll see you here in the World of Tanks Tank Arena. Thank you very much, guys.